Um, hi, everybody. As usual, always a pleasure to be here in another uh, Data on Kubernetes community meetup. This is our third meetup of the week, third out of five. Um, we have two meetups up to, uh, tomorrow, actually, and tomorrow we'll be doing our first meetup in Hindi, which is a historic movement for our, for our community moving forward. I'm always interested in branching out into other languages. If anybody else who's out there, you know, speaks a different language and would like to have content in that language, we're always open to it. Between today and tomorrow, I have to learn how to say, hi, my name is Bart, and I don't speak Hindi. Um, so that's my challenge, my homework. But, but anyway, um, a couple of announcements as well, too, just because we have very, very big stuff happening next week. Uh, we will be having our co-located event in KubeCon. And so I will be leaving the schedule here um, in the chat. It's totally free. Um, so everyone, everyone can get there. If you, even if you're not registered for KubeCon, you can just talk to us and we'll get you a link because it'll be live broadcast on YouTube. Um, very excited though, to have a mixture of, uh, of different talks from quite a few different countries, uh, different experiences, end user uh, talks, use cases, et cetera. So anyway, very, very excited about this and, and also a part of our integration as a community into the CNCF. So big shout out to the CNCF. Um, but anyway, that being said, uh, very excited to have the speaker that we have with us today, Prashanto from Trilio, who's no stranger to the issue of getting data on Kubernetes, all the things that come along with that data migration, frequently told, leave data where it is, don't touch it, let sleeping dogs lie. But sometimes we just don't have that option. The same way we're thinking about, you know, storage for our own personal belongings in our houses and we have to move it from one place to another. Data can be a very delicate thing. Um, so very much looking forward to hear from you, Prashanto. But before, before we get into, you know, to your actual presentation, can you just give us a little bit of background about yourself, how you got into the data space, your first experiences with Kubernetes, so we can get a little bit of context. Sure, thanks, but uh, So I have been, so I come from a, uh, my historical work uh, uh, stuff has been with storage. So I've come from an EMC background. After that, I was uh, you know, part of a uh, lot of hyper-converged uh, appliances, you know, building and working uh, with different solutions out of the HPE after that. And uh, you know, over the past five years, I've been very deeply involved with containers. Uh, you know, initially started off uh, going down the Docker and the Docker Swarm route and then uh, you know when kubernetes became the de facto kind of uh, solution for running uh, microservices uh, you know pivoted on kubernetes started building a lot of solutions uh, on top of kubernetes you know working with data storage uh, you know all kinds of use cases around migrations portability and so on and then uh, you know, now I'm at uh, Trilio, where I lead the uh, product over there, our Kubernetes offering, which is, which focuses on data management and data protection. And uh, you know, very very excited to be here to you know talk about what we have been doing, and you know, um, do a demo as well of the solution as to how it's built and what it can achieve for all the customers that we are targeting. And with that in mind, you know, just because like you said, like you have been working in the storage world for quite some time and often, uh, you know, because this is a relatively new thing, I mean, you know, if we're considering, you know, how long Kubernetes has been around and then when it was originally designed, a lot of these questions about data weren't necessarily present in those conversations, but now they're becoming more and more commonly focused. And obviously that's why we have our community. What are some just basic things that you would say or resources that you would recommend for folks out there saying like, if you're going to get into this, I would definitely recommend checking out this resource or keeping this best practice in mind. Just basic knowledge that we can that we can have as a starting point. I think, I mean, uh, of course, probably without saying, but I think everyone should be aware of, uh, you know, the different uh, advancements that have been happening in terms of uh, CSI and also understanding, you know, what was the landscape before CSI and why, uh, why the Kubernetes community decided to, you know, build something like the container storage interface and uh, you know where it is heading from that point on because you know the changes are so rapid that uh, you know it's always good to kind of have a level set as to why the historical background and where you're going into you know as uh, people start getting more and more applications into the kubernetes space mm -hmm. Very, very good. Um, and, you know, in terms because obviously as well, you know, like in our, in our community, we have a mixture of profiles of SREs, of DBAs, DevOps, et cetera. So everyone kind of comes at this from a different angle. What do you frequently find inside organizations, you know, because obviously being you know, head of product, what are, what are some of the cultural changes that probably need to be in place in order to have a higher likelihood, a higher probability of success when approaching this whole subject of running stateful workloads databases on Kubernetes? I think, uh, you know, firstly, because 
cloud native applications have been built so differently. You know, they're not the same monolithic kind of giants we used to work with in a VM based world. Um, you know, one is def definitely there is a you know stronger correlation between your development and your ops teams. Um, you know, uh, there needs to be better understanding in terms terms of you know who's providing the infrastructure who's running the applications who's monitoring the application so i think um, you know from a from a criteria of success definitely having that integration between the different teams and the different organizations and bus is going to be very very important um, you know there are a lot of uh, different uh, trends which we'll be discussing as part of the talk as well you know around uh, getops and so on which have become very popular i think uh, what folks also need to understand is, you know, when, when, when you have GitOps, there is still, you know, a uh, data management and a data protection kind of realm that they still need to address, you know, especially in terms of disaster recovery and so on. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of, uh, I would say, you know, that's, that's the kind of advice that I would probably provide to whoever is, you know, looking to do more of data on Kubernetes. Very, very good. That being said, let's jump right into your presentation. Thank you so much, but I'm going to share my screen here. Let me know when yep. you can see it. Okay. I'll let you know. Okay, I'm actually, before that, I'm going to just turn off all my notifications so that... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yep. And... Yeah, speaking, speaking of best practices, that's definitely a good one. <laughs> okay. Right. Perfect. We got it. Awesome. Oh, and just, just as a reminder to all the folks that are that are joining us today, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them accordingly. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you, Bart. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Prashant Kochibara. I'm the director of product at Trilio. And I am uh, really happy to be here and talking about uh, you know data on Kubernetes uh, in terms of how you recover and you port your applications in this uh, fast-paced DevOps world. Uh, you know, also focusing on the protection and the application centricity of backup and recovery for your database and, you know, database applications as well. So the agenda for today is uh, pretty short and sweet, um, you know, an introduction as to who is Trilio. We will uh, talk about, you know, some of the challenges that we are solving in the DevOps space. Uh, we'll talk about some of the industry trends that we've been noticing around data and why data on Kubernetes is so important and why it is here to stay and where it is going in a way. Um, after that, we'll talk about Trillio World for Kubernetes. That's the product that we offer, uh, you know, going through the, the what aspects as to the features and how it is built, how it works and how it performs. Uh, we also cover some security aspects of the product uh, as well. And then after that, we will jump into a demo uh, showing you, a, you know, whatever we have spoken about the product, you know, showing that in action. And we will emphasize it even further by talking about a case study uh, that we have, uh, you know, of a customer using Trillium World for Kubernetes in production. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, so who is Trillio? So Trillio as an organization was founded in 2013. Um, you know, we started off, uh, you know, we were working jointly with Red Hat and we uh, built two products around data protection, data management for OpenStack and Red Hat virtualization. Uh, you know, we patented all the technology and uh, after that we uh, worked again with Red Hat to build uh, a Kubernetes offering as well. And right now we support all these three different uh, platforms uh, from you know, fully uh, managing the data and obviously protecting the data as well. Uh, we have our engineering is global around the world. We have sales and services uh, folks uh, all across the globe as well. From a customer perspective, um, you know, we have customers in defense, automotive, telco, MSPs, and a uh, lot many more verticals as well. Uh, from a funding perspective, we have uh, 22 million in funding from, you know, leading VCs. Uh, and, you know, we've been making quite the uh, news uh, because of all the work that we've been doing around the Kubernetes space. We have a very broad partner ecosystem all across the globe again. And, you know, all our technology is certified by Red Hat, IBM. And in fact, you know, we've actually 
for the Kubernetes product, we've gone through additional certifications and validations as well, which basically have ensured that we've uh, you know, put the best technology in front of customers. Now, talking about the challenges that we solve, right? When it comes to applications or database uh, applications, uh, firstly, you know, application aware point in time capture and recovery is what we help with. Uh, when we talk about databases, we think about databases, it is really important to get a consistent backup of the database. So we support all of that through you know, hooks and features as such. Uh, we also enable uh, customers to move their applications from one environment into another environment. Now, whether you are doing this for uh, you know, cost reasons or performance reasons or, you know, whether it's just an upgrade reason, uh, you know, you can do all of that with the Trilio product. Um, the other point that I mentioned earlier with uh, GitOps, you know, GitOps is great and it uh, works very, very well in this, uh, you know, uh, declarative era or this, uh, uh, you know, microservices based uh, fashion or uh, world that we live in. However, you know, there are a lot of, uh, lot of gaps in the operations of GitOps in terms of disaster recovery and so on. And that is where we add value by, <clears throat> excuse me, by providing a turnkey solution uh, as well. And then finally, uh, what we have seen with certain customers is uh, they also like to use Trilio for their CICD uh, processes. So whether it is, you know, uh, testing at scale in different environments or uh, you know, taking a copy of the production data and using that for, you know, more rigorous testing and improving the, uh, you know, the improving the uh, quality of success and the uh, reasoning for success uh, continuously by leveraging the underlying technology. Now, talking about the Kubernetes trends, why data on Kubernetes is important and why it's, you know, uh, going to go through some really massive growth in you know, this year and the next years to come is because when we look at the right, uh, the graphic on the left is from 2017 or late 2017, 20, uh, yeah, I think early 2017 uh, as well. But uh, the idea or the objective of that uh, graphic here is to show that, you know, back in the day, two, three years ago, we still had uh, storage as a major challenge within Kubernetes. You know, there were Kubernetes was great for stateless applications, but as soon as you were adding storage, there was you know still uh, some friction, and you know there was a lot of inertia in terms of getting that going. But we fast forward that. Uh, you know, we looked uh, look at 2020, and this is a graphic from uh, CNCF survey, and we see there are a lot many more customers now using uh, storage and database type of workloads in production. And if they are not in production, they are either evaluating it and are going to be moving into production very soon. Again, this graphic is from, I would say, July 2020. That was when the last uh, CNCF survey happened. Um, and we can probably expect these numbers to be much higher uh, you know, if we do a point in time survey at the moment. So. The other item, uh, you know, what we are seeing in terms of how customers are using uh, and packaging their applications is firstly, uh, you know, from a application packaging point of view, Helm is becoming very, very popular. Obviously people have used Helm for the stateless and use it for the stateful workloads as well. Other technologies like operators uh, are also becoming very, very popular in terms of packaging. Uh, and then when we look at how people are used to separating their applications or managing uh, their applications within a cluster, we see a lot of them using namespaces and using labels to do so. Uh, the reason being, you know, namespaces and labels are, pro you know, provided within a Kubernetes cluster from the get-go. So everyone has access to those. So, you know, because of, uh, them being present within the cluster right from the get go, uh, customers and prospects, you know, they start using these uh, 
these items to manage and separate the application very well. So, you know, Helm, namespaces, labels, operators, all are different ways of either, you know, packaging your application, managing your application, or segregating your applications. Um, now, jumping into what Trillio World for Kubernetes is. You know, we've kind of gone through the trends around data and stuff. We've gone through the trends around how applications are being managed. These could be your database applications uh, as well. Now, what we have done at Trilio, we've built this product, which is fully application centric. What that means is we not only protect the data volumes, but we also protect all the Kubernetes objects, the metadata, you know, all the configuration, YAML, the resource files, everything that comprises of the application. Now, you know, uh, we explained the namespace label Helm operator different ways of, you know, managing and protecting apps. And we support all of these different ways that users would be uh, leveraging and deploying the application. So we allow backups and restores of Helm applications for operator-based applications. We can do backups and restores based on just labels. And then you can do, uh, again, you can capture your application and restore it based on namespaces as well. So depending on however you have been using the environment, we will be able to support you and protect you. Now, the way the product has been developed, it is completely native to Kubernetes. You know, we are packaged as an operator-based application. So we are a Kubernetes-based application that is packaged as an operator deployed into Kubernetes uh, as a bunch of custom resource definitions. If you're aware of custom resource definitions, these are, you know, kind of uh, templates that a user would fill out to create some additional resources or to perform certain tasks. So what we have done is we have packaged our entire product as these mini templates to capture, to restore, to automate, and so on, uh, which makes it very easy to use the product, whether it's from a CLI perspective or whether it's from a UI perspective. Um, we are fully integrated into KubeCuttle. So one of the really cool things that we have from customers that they like about our product is that there is no separate CLI to manage. They love the fact that it's all you know, integrated into the API server and all they need to do uh, in order to you know, uh, do any kind of infrastructure as code with Trilio. Now, from an infrastructure compatibility perspective, uh, we provide uh, we provide a choice in terms of the backup repository or the location where you know we capture the applications and store them. So we support NFS and we support object storage like S3. The S3 can be AWS S3 or can be any S3 compatible uh, storage. Uh, so you have a range to choose from, you know, either NAS or uh, from a object storage uh, device, you know, depending upon what your needs are, what your organization has been using, you can use either or. We communicate with the underlying storage via CSI. So as long as you're using a CSI driver for your, uh, you know, data applications, we will automatically out of the box be able to talk to the storage, capture, you know, the data aspects of it and move it into a target repository. Um, so again, you know, zero configuration needed just works out of the box. Um, so as a result, what happens is, you know, we become very, very nimble and agile, uh, can run in any environment, whether it's a public cloud environment, private cloud environment, uh, you know, we leverage all the abstractions provided by Kubernetes itself. And, uh, you know, it basically becomes very easy to manipulate, manage and maneuver the application as such. Now, from a uh, certification perspective, I mentioned that, you know, we are uh, certified by Red Hat IBM. We also have uh, received certification from Rancher as well as VMware. Uh, what these certifications provide, you know, is an additional level of satisfaction and guarantee to the customer that, hey, this product has been developed in the, you know, most, uh, uh, you know, in, according to the best practices that Kubernetes has put forth and, uh, you know, they have the peace of mind that there are no you know, security flaws and glitches uh, that they'll be introducing into their system. Uh, along 
with all these uh, features, we also have a um, you know, lot of other features around hooks that I mentioned to take application consistent backups of your databases. We have qualified about, you know, I'll say 15 databases at the moment. It's all available. All the hooks and how to use them are all available uh, on uh, our public documentation itself. And, uh, you know, along with that, we also support uh, manipulation of uh, the data items or the or your backup items when you are restoring it. So if you want to change things like storage classes, uh, you know when you're moving an application from one cluster to another cluster, you can uh, completely do that from the Trilio platform. In fact, as part of the demo, I will be going through uh, that uh, piece as well and showing everyone how that happens. A lot of data efficiency built into the platform. Um, you know, we use, uh, we have full, we, we have synthetic backups, we use overlay images. Uh, so as a result, we can do forever incremental backups. Now, when we uh, do that, we not only save uh, on the storage capacity on the backup target, but also the amount of data that we send over the wire or the network is very, very uh, minimal. So as a result, we are super efficient. And from a performance standpoint, it really helps, uh, you know, achieving our PRTOs uh, successfully. Really quickly, um, Prashant, we have a question from Sarya. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Sarya, for the question. The question is, what is the state of app-aware storage device snapshotting in Kubernetes? Is it common or uncommon? Does it depend on the app? I heard that SQL, ser the SQL Server on Linux doesn't support it yet. So uh, can you repeat that question, Bart, if I understood Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, 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 no worries. So the question is, what is the state of app-aware storage device snapshotting in Kubernetes? Right, so right now, uh, basically the application aware, so when we talk about being application aware, we basically focus on, you know, the quiescing aspects of the application, right? To make sure that the application supports certain features and certain calls to make sure that it can get the database into a consistent fashion before taking the backup. Uh, so most of the applications that we've seen, you know, whether it's uh, MySQL, Cassandra, Mongo, uh, you know, Redis, Couch, all of these applications already have capabilities to, you know, quiesce the application. And that is what we are using within our framework to talk to the application, quiesce it, take a backup, and then restore it. Does that uh, hopefully answer your question? Let's see. Um, I, yes, perfect. Keep going. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that question. And uh, moving along from where I stopped, uh, you know, we, uh, as part of the Twilio product, we also, you know, uh, take all the metrics that we have and we push it to Prometheus. So, you know, out of the box integration with uh, Prometheus as well. And um, we also have provided about 10 dashboards for Grafana, which is a starting point for customers using Grafana. Uh, obviously these dashboards can be, you know, manipulated, changed, edited the way you want them to. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good starting point if Grafana is your, you know, single source of truth for visualization. Uh, we also have a management console, you know, uh, we understand that, you know, from a developer perspective, uh, folks like to use the uh, API and the CLI for integration automations and so on. But from the ops side, you know, we also have uh, heard a lot of requests for, you know, having a management console that can achieve these things in a, you know, pretty click driven fashion. We'll be going through the management console as part of the demo as well. And I'll be kind of uh, explaining how we built that. Now, from uh, from a go to market standpoint, as to how we are pushing the solution to customers or making customers uh, make avail of our solution, is we have different kinds of licenses. So we follow a freemium model, and uh, we have a free license, which is free for about uh, thirty days, unlimited usage of the product. Then we have a basic license, which is also free. Uh, it's free for 10 nodes up to, uh, well, with no time limit. So 10 nodes forever. And then we have the enterprise edition, which comes with, you know, all the premium support and, you know, premium set of features with, uh, you know, customer success manager and so on. So depending upon, you know, 
uh, how you want to start using the product, you can start off with the free versions, migrate into the enterprise version, uh, you know, however you want to do it. Now, from a packaging and accessibility perspective, what we've done, as we mentioned earlier, we are an operator-based application, right? So we have an operator that we support via Helm, um, which is used for any, any distribution that uh, is CNCF conformant uh, uh, and you know, uh, works with against upstream as well. So any distribution uh, that is qualified for upstream will work, uh, will use the upstream operator or the Helm chart that we have. And then if you are an OpenShift customer, what we've done is we've also uh, aligned or adopted the operator lifecycle manager framework and uh, use that to integrate our product with OpenShift. Okay, so there are two different ways depending upon the kind of distributions that uh, you would be using. Now, I'm just gonna build this slide to kind of provide some color on how the overall application has been built. Oops. Sorry. So one of the things that uh, we've done, as I mentioned earlier, the entire product is built as custom resource definitions. I'm just going to keep it like this. I think there's an animation that keeps moving me forward. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, everything is a custom resource definition. So where you store your backup, the target uh, is a custom resource definition. Your policy is one, your hooks are one you create something known as a backup plan, which can be one Helm application or multiple Helm applications, can be multiple label-based applications, can be multiple operator. However, and uh, you know, however you want to define that plan or whatever you want to protect or you know, however you see your protection scope as, that is what you put in the backup plan. And obviously it has references to where it's going, uh, you know, how long it's going to be retained for, how often you want to do the backups and obviously any hooks to use. Once you define that backup plan, you use another custom resource uh, definition that we have, which is for a backup. Now, once you create a backup, all you need to do is point to the backup plan uh, that you have defined earlier and that will complete your overall backup operation. And then when you do a restore, obviously you can do a restore based on the name of the backup. But let's say if you're restoring into a completely new cluster, all you need to do is ensure that that uh, backup target is connected to the new cluster, and then you can restore directly from the target into any namespace. And then once you restore, you get your application back and whatever you had designed it to be, whether it was based on Helm label operator or the entire namespace itself. Now, um, I mentioned we do backups of namespaces, labels, helms, and operators. And uh, what we do as part of a namespace backup is, you know, we collect all the different resources that are within the namespace, you know, all the applications, all the objects, and we capture everything uh, when we do a backup. When we do a label-based backup, we, uh, you know, we find all the objects talking to the Kubernetes API server, you know, which match those labels, whether they are pods, you know, PVs, config maps, secrets. And if we see any data volumes being uh, mounted by any of the pods, we will back up those uh, uh, PVs or those data volumes themselves. From a Helm perspective, uh, all the user needs to do is provide the name of the Helm release and we will go take care of finding every piece of resource that is required and do a full uh, proper Helm backup. Now, when I say a proper Helm backup, what that means is, uh, you know, firstly, we find all the objects related to the Helm chart, but we also maintain the application or the packaging consistency when you do a backup and when you do a restore. So what that means is, uh, when you do a Helm backup and do a restore, your commands like Helm upgrade, Helm rollback, uh, you know, all those commands still work and you will still be able to manage it as a Helm-based application. Similarly, on the operator side, you know, when you're backing up operators, we allow you to back up the operator resources, the application resources, as well as any custom resources created by the operator. So when you are moving these kind of applications, you do not have to worry about losing the packaging consistency or anything on those lines. We will take care of that for you. 
Oh, and sorry, really quickly, just a quick question. Could you explain the concept of a non-disruptive backup? Correct. So non-disruptive uh, backup means that, you know, firstly, we do not, uh, you do not need to change anything to your application when the backup is happening, right? Your application is kept pristine. It is always running. You don't have to shut it down or anything. Uh, we do not even need you to inject any agent into the application. And I know we, agents was a term used in a virtualized world a lot. Uh, so, you know, we do not even require you to insert any sidecars or anything as such into the application. So, you know, completely non-disruptive, your application keeps running. We come in, do our work and, you know, uh, the application does not even realize it. Perfect. Thank you. Anytime. Now, from a security perspective, uh, you know, we've done and made a lot of different uh, uh, advancements and you know, things within the product, uh, which, you know, again, contribute to that additional peace of mind that I was talking about for customers. So, you know, firstly, we do not require any admin access to operate the product. You know, we leverage the regular pod security policies or, you know, SECs that are defined within the Kubernetes distribution. Um, we use our own service accounts. We do not use any of the default service accounts. Uh, some of our service accounts are also created at runtime to provide additional padding and uh, security. Uh, in fact, you know, we've done uh, so much work around security in terms of, you know, what we use, what we touch and uh, how we, you know, what kind of authorization that we have, that we have documented all of this in our uh, public documentation, you know, showing each and every resource that we touch, the verbs that we use for those resources and so on. And then uh, we've also created a security, uh, you know, security definition page or a section within our documentation, which talks about, you know, uh, how data is managed and, you know, kept secure uh, within, when we are dealing with it within the Kubernetes platform or when we are using it outside of the Kubernetes platform as well. So we spoke about uh, our management console. Uh, we'll be going through this uh, deeper in the uh, demo that I'll be doing. But uh, the idea here is to kind of let users know it's a multi-cloud management console. So you know, no matter where your Kubernetes cluster is running, you can manage all those clusters under the same pane of glass. Uh, you know, you can move things across those uh, Kubernetes clusters uh, very, very seamlessly, all through click-driven workflows. So this is a good slide that uh, helps me summarize what uh, you know Twilio World for Kubernetes does. So in a way, uh, you know, if you capture an application and uh, move it into a target repository, you can restore that into a different namespace of the same Kubernetes cluster. You can also restore that into a completely uh, separate namespace of a separate Kubernetes cluster itself. So as a result, what happens is there are different use cases that get enabled, right? As we mentioned earlier, the backup and recovery kind of use cases, disaster recovery type of use cases, mobility of your application, CI, CD, and obviously migration from one distribution to another uh, or one you know, cloud environment to another. So all of these items get very easily achieved uh, with the Trillia World for Kubernetes platform. Oh, and another question. What kind of data is the most difficult data to back up? Data in queues? I would say, uh, you know, yes. I would say if there is data in queues and message buffers and things, you know, uh, if they are being stored on different uh, host path volumes and not, you know, direct persistent volumes, those would be probably the most difficult to back up. Uh, what needs to happen is, you know, again, through the hooks based feature, you should be able to uh, push those changes and push those IOs, uh, which are still not committed onto the disk. And then once you do that, again, you should be, in a, uh, you should be able to capture a consistent backup. So it is, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's complex than doing a regular persistent volume or an application with a persistent volume backup, but it's still uh, easily doable with the Trillio World platform. All right. And another question, different topic uh, from Sherry, this one. Uh, what's the biggest pain point of CI? Um, from a CI perspective, uh, 
you know, again, we we do, uh, you know, we we focus more on the CD aspect of it when we talk about Trilio. But from a CI perspective, you know, continuous integration, I would say, you know, um, there are again going back to the terminology of GitOps, right? People are using GitOps and building all this automation for their CI processes. I would say uh, there is still some manual workflow and you know rightly so there's still some manual workflows required manual approvals required uh if we were to eliminate that you know personally i would say that you know that would just be super awesome but you know there are security reasons and things that people have that, those in place uh, but in my 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 in my head and my logic i think you know if that was made super seamless and super automated that would be you know that would be the biggest pain point all right perfect thank you Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, about before I move into the demo? Um, yeah, there was one, but I, I was gonna I was gonna say it for the end. But if you want, I can just jump in right now. Um, somebody asked previously, actually, when we were taking questions before the meetup. I know Trilio offers a cloud native offers cloud native data protection, backup, and recovery. Does the company have any plans on attacking the challenge of creating full disaster recovery plans for Kubernetes clusters, sort of like what they do in Valero? Full disaster recovery plans for Kubernetes clusters. Yes, in fact, uh, you know, we'll be discussing, uh, you know, at KubeCon next week, we'll be talking about some of the new features that we'll be packaging with the product, which provide a single workflow to, you know, uh, do a DR of all your applications. So whether you are running stateless, stateful, you know, data, everything, you'll have a single workflow to you know, pick the different backups that you want from different uh, backup locations and actually create a uh, plan for your disaster recovery uh, needs. And then by a click of a button, uh, you know, Trilio will actually go ahead and start restoring everything in parallel or in uh, sequential order, however you define it to be. Okay, very good. And that talk will be on what day? Uh, so we are uh, releasing, um, you know, talking about all these things at uh, KubeCon at our booth, uh, you know, at, this, uh, at the CNCF event. So, you know, anyone who is interested can stop by the booth and we can provide, you know, more of a demo and, you know, details around it. Very, very good. And then we had a follow, just a quick follow-up question from Sherry about continuous integration. So in terms of CI, what's an example of one manual process that still isn't um, automated or still can't be automated? So, I mean, I would say that uh, from a CI angle, you know, there are still a lot of approvals and everything that are, needed i mean you can you can automate it still you know moving things from the uh, dev to test test to production there are a lot of uh, you know approvals and things that need to happen so you could still automate it depending upon your organization and the kind of checks and the validations that you need but uh, you know most most often you still have to have the manual play button because of you know just security and organizational needs um so yeah, I would say that you know if you are able to build that out in such a fashion that uh, you know as as the validations pass, just push it into production. That would definitely save a lot of time, and you know that would uh, solve a lot of different needs as well. But that is where you know that is where we come into the picture, right? Well, if you think about if you think about uh, you know as part of the CI CD process, um, you know. If you run into a disaster, you know, if you have to wait for all these manual approvals from multiple different teams uh, who are developing their applications, your disaster recovery RTO, you know, or just your RTO and getting your business uh, operations back up again are going to suffer very heavily. So you need that single solution that can do all this for you. And generally, you know, whenever you are doing all the CI stuff uh, or the CD stuff, there are uh, you know, as much as I said, you know, you want to automate things, there are still going to be some areas where you may need to you know, press a manual button or do some manual uh, piece here and there, whether it is, you know, uh, for a technical reason or whether it is for a business reason, you know, those things keep happening over and over again. So, you know, that's where Trilio comes into the picture and helps you, uh, you know, have that peace of mind that, hey, in case something goes wrong, I don't need to call all my application developers and have them build everything again, but I can just use Trilio to, you know, do a quick DR of the entire app or my entire environment. 
All right, very good. Cool, let's jump into the demo. Perfect. Uh, so what we're going to do as part of this demo, we're going to do a backup of a namespace running WordPress. Um, again, this is just a quick WordPress app that I deployed using customize using, you know, just the binaries from the Kubernetes.io uh, workspace. I did not really even set up the WordPress app, but I just wanted to kind of show that we are working with data volumes behind the scenes. Um, so from an environment perspective, what we are going to be doing is uh, we will be using Rancher. From a storage standpoint, uh, I think on one of the clusters, I have a host path driver, which is you know, not an enterprise grade driver, just for demo purposes. And then on the 1.20 environment, I believe I have a EBS CSI driver. And then from a target perspective, we are storing all the data in AWS S3. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna stop my presentation. And uh, but can you confirm that you can still see my web browser? Yep. Okay, awesome. So what you see in front of you right now is our management console. Uh, and the way you log into the management console is via a cube config file. And within uh, this cluster right now, I have about three different clusters connected. The primary one is, I've just called it primary, but uh, this is a Rancher 1.19 cluster. This is an RKE 1.20 cluster, and I have an OpenShift cluster here as well, which we are not going to use, but uh, we're going to focus on the uh, first and the second ones. So just kind of driving you through the UI, uh, the left-hand side panel is all the navigation panel. So, you know, selecting your, uh, you know, clusters or your namespace and, you know, diving into the applications that you want to protect. What we do is depending on what the user has selected. Um, so for example, if you know there was a default namespace that was selected here, we discover all the applications for the user. You know, so we find all the applications that may be based on labels. You know, if there was a persistent volume that exists, uh, you can filter based on that. It seems like we have a MySQL application over here. You can obviously view the information about that. Uh, MySQL app as well as to what are the different pieces that will be collected or captured if you do a backup of it. Uh, what we also allow is, uh, you know, Helm and the operator pieces. So we have another view here, which lets you choose your Helm and your operator based apps. So a user could come here and you, know, you can just say that, hey, I want to back up my AWS EBS Helm chart. And again, here we'll show you exactly what all will be captured if the user chooses this. So bear in mind, as the user moves from the different views and selects what he wants to protect, we are automatically keeping track of all that information here, showing him, um, you know, him or her exactly what is going to be captured as part of the backup. The third view that we have is uh, just a view of all the objects that we can find in the system. So one of the things that um, you know we hear often is people want to back up secrets or config maps. So you can directly you know just filter on secrets, and we'll go find any kind of secret within the system or you know within the namespace that you've selected, and you know we can capture that again. Once you select the secret, that will be added to the list of items here as well. Now uh, what happens is. Once you're satisfied with whatever you want to protect, or you know, this is your protection scope, or the different items that you want to back up, all you need to do is click on the backup button. And what we'll first do is we'll first search for a backup plan. Uh, if there is a plan that has uh, any um, any of these items that you've already selected prior, you know, so if there was a backup plan with all these different uh, applications or objects, we will first show you that saying that, hey, Mr. Customer, do you want to use this backup plan or do you want to create a new one? So they have the flexibility in doing that. Uh, I'm just going to unselect all of this over here. And I'm going to talk about the monitoring panel. Um, so actually, I missed talking about one point. So we also have this view called backup plans. I don't have anything in this namespace, but uh, let's see, maybe in this other one. Yep. 
So if you have created a backup plan before and you just want to come in and reuse it very, very quickly versus having to go through the entire process of selecting apps, we also give you an easy view of whatever you have selected by providing you that option to backup again. Okay. Now, uh, coming to the right-hand side of the screen, this is our monitoring panel. So it's all context-driven, right? What we mean by that is right now, uh, the namespace here is selected. So we know that there is one uh, backup available for that namespace, right? I'm just gonna change this uh, time range. So we see that there was a Helm-based backup that we did of uh, one of the applications that we were using here. Uh, you can view details as to you know, what happened as part of the, you know, what did really your uh, what are the steps that were taken? You know, where was the backup going? You know, were there any hooks or policies that were used? And obviously, you know, very importantly, what is the metadata that was uh, used as well? Right? You can click on the details to see, you know, get more information about uh, all of the metadata that was used. So, uh, in the interest of time, what I'm going to do next is I'm uh, going to just go ahead and do a quick backup of our WordPress application. And before that, just to give everyone an idea, oh, you can still uh, see my lens view, right? Yep, and we got a, we got a question. Um, what is yeah. meant by a, what, what, do you, what do you refer to when you say a hook? So a hook is basically a injection of a command before we snapshot and back up the application, right? So think about your application is running. So the hook is a way to inject something into a pod to quiesce it uh, or the application to quiesce it. And, or, you know, it could be anything that you want to do with the application just before the backup happens. So any kind of consistency activities, uh, all of those will be handled through hooks. Perfect, thank you. Most welcome. Okay, so what I wanted to show you was the WordPress application uh, you know, uh, has all these different objects and the PVC is based on CSI host path over here. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead here, click on backup, I will call this WordPress backup number seven. And I click on save. So the backup will start, you know, the logs will keep updating in terms of, you know, what we are doing. Uh, we can obviously monitor it from the backup summary view as well. It's in progress. Uh, but while that is happening, I will move on to, you know, the other places of the UI. Uh, you know, these are, these are, uh, this is another tab where you manage all your different uh, resources. So if you create a backup plans, you will see them here. I haven't created any hooks or retention policies, uh, this namespace, but if I had, I would be able to see them here. Um, again, from a target perspective, let's see if I have a target here. Yes, I have to change the namespace here, but we do have a target over here. And then obviously we have something around disaster recovery plans as well, which, you know, as I mentioned, we'll be talking more about at the uh, KubeCon conference next week. Uh, any, any other questions? but before I kind of uh, change gears and move along. Uh, yeah, we got another question. Um, could you demo a hook as an, uh, could you show an example of a hook? Sure, what I can do is uh, show you exactly what we have developed. So this is a public documentation, docs.tutor.io forward slash Kubernetes. Um, anything and everything that I have mentioned here, if you want to, you know, want to get more color on it, obviously you can reach out to me, but your know, documentation is also the best place to get all that info. So if you see there are hooks for, you know, uh, a MySQL hook, we provide a pre-exec action. Uh, so what happens is we use these commands and run a kubectl exec uh, against a particular container. And that container is defined in the hook config of the backup plan. So just to kind of add some color, this is the hook and this is the backup plan that uses the hook. So once you've defined the hook as to what are the commands and everything you need, 
you tell your backup plan that, hey, I want to run the hook. The name of the hook is whatever I'd created before, my SQL hook. And I want to run this against a particular pod, match that pod by these labels that I'm providing you. The regular expression uh, will be my SQL hyphen QA with an asterisk for you know, wildcard. And then finally the container within the pod that you want to run this against. Yeah. So the same kind of flow follows for, you know, whether it's Cassandra, uh, whether it's Mongo, uh, MariaDB, Redis, you know, Postgres. So we've tested, validated all these different applications and, you know, we, we're pretty much doing almost one or two apps every week and we are adding and, you know, continuously building uh, this stuff out. I think the latest one that we added was for Cockroach, uh, which is available here. Very good. Just a follow-up question to that. Will you put that hook example in the demo and run it? In the demo right now. So I don't think it's uh, going to work in the demo at the moment. I mean, uh, if we, we can totally create the hook, but it's going to fail because, uh, you know, I, as I said, it's, I just deployed this WordPress application really, really quick. But, uh, but we do have, uh, I would say, we do have a lot of demos and videos that we in in the in the same documentation page that you're sharing right now. Uh, in the documentation page as well as well uh, as on our website. So you know, that, okay. In fact, we recently did a white paper with uh, Red Hat, you know, which talks about application consistent backups with OCS uh, underneath the covers, and uh, in that we do a uh, application consistent backup for WordPress, which was using MySQL behind the scenes. Okay. Um, but yeah, but yeah, like you said, for the sake of time, might be better to continue with other stuff um, just uh, to, to finish up. Exactly. So what I'll do is I'll go back here. Let's see, click on the WordPress namespace again. Change this to namespace view. And we can see that the backup completed. Uh, we can view the YAMLs to understand you know, what was what was happening behind the scenes under the covers. Um, you know, obviously if you want to use this and do some automation, you can copy all of this and do that as well. Now, what we'll do is we'll go to our RKE 1.20 cluster and just to make sure, uh, let's see, get all. So there's nothing in the restore three namespace at the moment. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go into, uh, see, I need to go into the target. I'm going to launch a browser to the target. This is the backup plan that we just did, 4.29, 12.50, that's two minutes ago. I'm going to click on that, WordPress backup seven. I'm going to click on restore. I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call this WordPress restore seven. Uh, restore three is the namespace that we were looking at earlier. I'm going to say that if there is any kind of um, info or random objects existing, we can skip that. Obviously, there's nothing, but I just like to use this flag. Uh, I can go into the advanced section and I can add a transform. So there was no Helm component here, so we don't see anything around the Helm component. But uh, we do have uh, persistent volume claims. And the interesting thing, which I will show you quick, is this changes to EDS C and to apply this. But just want to switch gears over here. If I do a okay, so actually this one I was playing around with it. I'm going to do a cute battle delete SC CSI postpart SC. Okay. Right now we just have one uh, one storage class available, and if you remember, we did a backup on the uh, host path CSI volume initially. Okay, uh, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to change one of the services, right? Because uh, I'm using a node port, and I have done a couple of restores in the same cluster, so I cannot use the same node port. So I need to change that. I'm going to uh, say spec ports. Okay. 
output and the number I will use is, uh, let me just confirm that. Make sure that I'm not going to overwrite anything over here. Three zero five eight nine. So I'm just going to use the next one. Okay, apply this. Now we have all our transformations created, and I'm going to click on save. We can view those transforms here. Again, exactly what we are doing. We're going to change the storage class and the node port. Click save. This is going to begin validations. Hopefully, I did not you know, fat finger something over there. But while that is going on, I'm going to move back into my slides to talk about a case study. And we'll go back to the fun piece of the demo once I'm done with that. But any questions uh, in the meantime? Uh, yeah, we got a question. What is uh, 3050 something? Oh, that is the node port. So generally, when you use a Kubernetes application, right, and uh, it's using a, a resource known as service, uh, and you use node port, node port is common across the cluster, right? So you cannot have application A using node port 30589 and application B in another namespace using 30589. It's common across the cluster. So you need to make sure that there is no node port conflict. And that is what I just changed right now to make sure that you know the restore happens successfully. Okay, one question as well. Notebook or note uh, or note or node put? Node port. So N O D P O T R T. There we go. Cool. Problem solved. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So a quick uh, compatibility slide as to what uh, you know what we are compatible with. So any Kubernetes, uh, you know, CNCF conformant distribution we'll work with. Storage wise, CSI target we spoke about. You know, any S three compatible storage, AWS S three as well as NFS. From an ecosystem perspective, uh, you know, we integrate directly into Grafana, Prometheus databases. Uh, you know, I do need to add a lot more different logos as you saw in the documentation. Uh, you know, we'll be updating this slide, but uh, a lot of different databases that have been uh, protected. Yeah, and and you mentioned Cockroach that was in the documentation, right? Yeah, yeah that, that's the one I was, I was thinking of. Yeah, shout out to Cockroach, we love Cockroach. Yes. <laughs> um, and obviously any cloud, you know, Kubernetes focuses on application uh, development and delivery, and that's what we are assisting with as well. Now, uh, let's quickly uh, go over a case study. So this is a customer that we have in the defense space, obviously, because of security reasons, I cannot mention who they are, but uh, they wanted a solution that would work uh, very natively on an open shift environment, right? Uh, they wanted uh, you know, full integration with uh, the storage that they were using, which was OCS, and they had a wide variety of applications that they had uh, deployed, Helm-based, uh, operator-based, and label-based. Um, and obviously, a big criteria for them was to make sure that it was all coming through a Red Hat certified stamp, uh, you know, through the operator hub and everything that Red Hat had provided. Now, from uh, the customer had a lot of uh, applications running in on the west side of the US, so you know Pacific Northwest and Western US itself, and they wanted to you know enable backup recovery, mobilization between the Kubernetes clusters, and they all wanted to do this within a single pane of glass, right? So eventually, they did choose Trilio for all the different uh, reasons, all the requirements that you see on the left. We were able to satisfy all of that, you know, native integration, out of the box integration. Um, you know, completely agnostic to the cloud, the platform, um, you know, to the storage being used technically, and then, you know, being able to move the data from one site to another site, uh, which is exactly, you know, what we'll be kind of concluding with the demo. So with that, I'm just going to move back to my demo to see everything completed. So the restore completed. That's good. I am going to go back to my cluster. Let's do a cube cuddle, get all. 
Okay, so firstly, we see everything is now created in this namespace. If you remember the node port that we used was 30590, which has been set. And for the big moment of truth, the storage volume has been changed to ABSSD. So just to keep in mind, we did a backup on CSI host path. The node port was 30585. Okay, and we changed all of that when we restored it into Kubernetes 1.20, okay? Uh, we are migrating from 1.19 into 1.20. We are changing things on the fly and making sure everything is available up and ready. Oh, one thing really quickly, uh, just asking, uh, are there any bugs or errors? And could maybe you make the uh, console window font bigger? There we go, just a little bit of zoom, I guess. Trying to see how do I make this Let's see. view size. Perfect. Yeah, so from our error perspective, I don't think we had any errors. Cube, cuddle, get pods. Uh, yeah, we have the WordPress pods running up and correctly. You know, validations were done, data restore done. If there was any issue with the validations, you know, like let's say if we fat fingered the transform or, you know, we entered something wrong, then we would definitely fail in the validation step itself. So we do a lot of uh, checks, you know, is there an existing object that you're going to be, uh, you know, is there going to be a conflict with notebooks? Is there going to be a conflict with any other item, you know, uh, uh, are the transform specified correctly? So all of that happens within the first 30 seconds itself. So if it had to fail and if there were any issues, it would have happened here. Once those validation checks are done, then we are probably 99.999% sure that everything's just going to work. So then that's where we move around with the data restore. Once the data is restored, we bring back all the metadata objects and then we connect the metadata to the data and that completes the restore. Cool. So with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Um, as I mentioned, we are going to be at uh, KubeCon next week. We are going to be talking and showing all these different cool things uh, much more, much more in detail around disaster recovery. You know, we have some cool things cooking in the background with uh, certain things we are doing with uh, Valero as well. So if you've heard of Valero, um, you know, it's uh, definitely, definitely I would uh, recommend you to stop by the booth and you know, check out what we've done. Okay, with that part, uh, I conclude my talk. Uh, you did a great job, you did a great job. As you can see, Prashanto gives, at least you were saying two or three talks per month. Um, it's very nice that you can set up a demo, keep a conversation going in the background and then come back and check the results. And the results were very good. So there was no demo effect. That's nice because it's yeah. even worse than giving a live talk. And then all of a sudden, wait, I just done this. I've done this six times already. I did these problems. My heartbeat fast. So yeah. Then, yeah, you know, that's okay. <laughs> but I think you ended yourself very well. And, and we had some really nice questions too. One final question I wanted to ask is, you know, like, uh, apart from, you know, data migration, and Kubernetes, what are some of the biggest challenges that you think are out there um, when we talk about data management and Kubernetes in general? Um, I would say, um, you know, and in general, you know, the term application is so stretched and vague, you know, I think that is one of the biggest challenges. So because of that, because of not having a standard framework, I think understanding an application itself is very challenging. Yeah. And from a data perspective, um, you know, I would say like if I don't think there is a challenge as such, I think, you know, when customers are running a lot more databases, when we start introspecting and talking to customer prospects a lot more, we understand uh, you know, that customers are much, much more ahead than, than what we had imagined them to be as well in the you know, data uh, adoption uh, trajectory. Uh, so I don't think there is a particular challenge in terms of data. You know, the Kubernetes community is doing a fantastic job in you know, fixing any kind of issues. Yeah, but I think, you know, it's just going to get better from here on. I think it's a really good point is because we're always talking about applications, but like you said, what is really the definition of an application? Um, you know, like when you talk to people that are outside this sort of, you know, ecosystem or space, 
uh, you frequently say like, they're like, oh, so you're talking about, you know, WhatsApp or Instagram or things like that. I was like, well, yes, but you know, then we're, we're going to have to look at things at a, at a more micro level. Um, so that's an interesting thing. Maybe I think it's, that could be an interesting panel at some point is to think about, let's drive that question forward. What is the definition of an application? How do we define that? Where, what is and what isn't um, in terms of examples? Anyway, well, we will definitely have to have you back on Prashanta because you had some great insights. And, and like I said, I think it was very well handled. You had some very nice questions. Um, so you got all the info. You can check out Trilio. Pretty easy to find on Twitter. Um, if you're going to be attending KubeCon next week, definitely stop by and visit their booth um, to get more info. Um, and if you have any other questions, of course, we can continue the conversation in our Slack. You're always welcome to jump in there. Um, Prashanta is very available and accessible, so you can you can, uh, you can can further the conversation there. Um, we will be putting our standard piece of artwork on Twitter um, in, in a bit. But since we, we are a little bit over time, unfortunately, I'll have to cut it right now. Uh, Prashanta, thank you very much for your time. It was a wonderful presentation. I'm sure everybody else who was here enjoyed it. Like I said, we had some great questions. Um, so we will be seeing you next week in KubeCon. Perfect. And uh, thank you for having me here. But uh, uh, I think uh, Sherry had a question around the hooks and stuff, right? Uh, so Sherry, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, after this, I can directly point you to, you know, the Red Hat white paper where I was talking about the hooks and uh, what the Slack link, the Slack link. Uh, oh, it's pretty easy. You just go to, if you just go to doc.community for our Slack, you can just jump right in there. Um, but, but yeah, but as you said, Prashant, if you contact directly on LinkedIn, on Twitter, yeah. um, uh, so anyway, and, and as you, you got all the other links as well too for Trilio's uh, documentation, as well as the CNCF study that you were referencing earlier about, you know, just how much was being done on Kubernetes related to uh, data production, et cetera, with containers. Um, anyway, that being said, we are a little bit over time, so I got to say goodbye. Um, thank you all very much. We'll be having two meetups of tomorrow, one in English and one in Hindi. Um, so you can be free to check those out as well, too. Um, Prashanta, thanks again for your time. Anytime, but thank you so much. And thank you for all the you know, awesome questions. Uh, definitely kept me intrigued as well as presenting. Thank you. Fantastic. Take care. Bye-bye.